Well, with Donald Trump's speech being regarded by some as more about conflict than peace, it's a concern for leaders trying to draw attention to humanitarian issues. There are also fears that the humanitarian work of the United Nations is being overshadowed by current international tensions. Andrew McLeod is a former high-level UN official who has been responsible for the coordination of big humanitarian operations like the 2005 Kashmir earthquake. He joins us now from London. Thanks for being there. Good morning. What did you make of the President's speech? Look, there's three things to say about the General Assembly this week. One is Donald Trump, two is United Nations sexual abuse, and three is United Nations effectiveness. All are equally important, but naturally the media is focusing on Donald Trump. His speech was, well, unusual to say the least, and I think the world can be genuinely concerned now about how issues with North Korea and how issues with Iran are going to unfold. I wrote a piece a couple of months ago for The Independent in the UK, quite frightening and I hope I'm wrong, but I don't see us getting to the end of the Trump presidency without a nuclear weapon being dropped somewhere. Well, the Venezuelan foreign minister said Mr Trump's speech was the opposite of the ideals of the UN. He, he spoke of war and destroying countries. How do you think that the president, president's choice of words would have gone down in the diplomatic community? Oh, not well at all, but there's one thing that's clear about Donald Trump is you can't measure Donald Trump by the normal measuring stick of politics and diplomacy. He's not a politician and he's not a diplomat and he just showed that again today. Uh, there is no ambiguity about his message though and let's not focus on people's hatred of Donald Trump. Let's also focus on the regime in North Korea. I've been to North Korea. It is a horrible country. And we must make sure that Kim Jong-un isn't allowed to use nuclear weapons and develop his nuclear weapon technology any further. So let's not distract the issue of North Korea onto an issue of a hatred of Donald Trump. Let's not make that mistake. Mr Trump singled out North Korea as well as Iran, Venezuela and other countries. But what did you make of the fact that he didn't mention Myanmar, which is at the moment the most prominent humanitarian crisis? At the moment, Myanmar is a tragic issue for the Rohingya people. There is no doubt about that. But the United Nations concerns itself mainly with threats to international peace and security. And when you look at threats to international peace and security, certainly Iran and North Korea are a higher priority than Myanmar. Certainly Myanmar needs to be on the UN and international community's agenda and we need to do something about that. But there's something else that Donald Trump also said. He also made the point that the UN needs to be able to provide allowances for whistleblowers. There is a piece of legislation from the Obama era that allows the United States to withhold 15% of funding to the United Nations if they don't have an effective mechanism in place for whistleblowers. So watch out for this cut to funding to the UN coming from Trump as well, because the UN does not protect whistleblowers, particularly around child sexual abuse. We'll get to that in a moment, um, but I wanted to talk about the bureaucracy uh, around the UN and the need for reform mm. as it was discussed at the General Assembly, um, something that the UN Secretary General didn't disagree with. What do you think is needed to reform the United Nations having been involved with it? I think the United Kingdom here is taking the lead in this. Priti Patel, who's the Minister for the Department for International Development here, has put some very strong and choice words out to UN agencies saying that a lot of the United Kingdom funding is now going to be conditional upon genuine bureaucratic reform. I think there are very, very strong arguments to show that the United Nations is top heavy, it is bloated with bureaucracy, it is very, very slow to respond, and it's not cost effective. And I'm not worried about money here. If you spend $100 to bring 100 people out of poverty and get a 10% efficiency gain, you don't now spend $90 to bring 100 people out of poverty. You still spend 100 and bring 110 people out of poverty. So when we talk about bureaucracy and effectiveness, it's because of the impact on people. And I hope the Australian government now follows the United Kingdom government's lead into demanding more effectiveness out of the UN system and a streamline in the bureaucracy. I mean, to think that you've got all of these agencies with different human resources systems Systems, different administrative systems, surely they could combine into one. Yeah, he, he lamented the high burden the US carries in terms of UN funding and he talked about it in terms of an investment that would be worth it if it returned the stated goal of peace. Do you agree with him? 
I do to an extent. You know, the United States funds about 23 percent of the overall UN budget and about 28 percent of peacekeeping budgets. As China continues to grow, India continues to grow, other countries in the world continue to grow, the United States is a smaller and smaller proportion of the global economy. So it's fair to ask the United States to pay less and less. Countries are supposed to pay in proportion to their economy. So as other countries grow, they should pay more. And Donald Trump is right, like Julie Bishop would be right, like Theresa May would be right, to say that countries who fund the United Nations need to see a return on investment, either in peace dividends or in humanitarian development dividends. We just can't fund bureaucracies that don't have demonstrable impact. Just returning to what you mentioned about whistleblowers, you've written a piece highlighting some United Nations shortcomings, namely that no one has been prosecuted over sexual exploitation mm. within the UN. Why haven't these crimes been addressed? That's a very good question. One of the three reasons I gave when I left the UN in 2009 was its lack of response to the institutionalised paedophilia. I used to call the United Nations the second largest harbour of paedophiles next to only the Catholic Church. I now think I'm wrong. I now think they're larger. The UN Secretary General admitted to 145 cases involving 311 victims just in peace operations and just in 2016. He then said yesterday that the most number of victims is in non-peace operations, so about 600 a year. Now, about one in ten rapes is reported in Australia and the UK, and if you assume that with the United Nations, those 600 victims represent 6,000 real victims in a single year. And there is this charter, a, a treaty on UN uh, rights and privileges that gives the United Nations immunity and the United Nations staff immunity from prosecution. So one thing I'm calling upon the United Kingdom and the Australian government to do is have the United Nations clearly state that legal immunity from prosecution does not apply to child sex crimes. It's time to end this shame. Hmm. Andrew McLeod, thanks for your time. Uh, one more thing, Jason, if I can add, add one more thing. Um, 30 years ago this Just year, briefly. my mother died of a brain tumour, and the last week was very, very painful. So for those Victorian legislations looking at the right to die law, the last thing my mother said to me before she died was, please, if you're ever in a position of power, allow people like me to have the choice to die. So I urge the Victorian legislators, please pass this legislation. Indeed, lots of passion in that issue. We'll have a story on that a bit later. Andrew McLeod, thanks for your time. Thank you.